God, give us the courage to hear what we need to hear. Give us the courage to do what you are calling us to do. And give us trust in your unfailing love. Amen. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so, what is wisdom? That's what we're talking about this morning. This whole passage in James is about wisdom. If you're with me on Saturday nights, I've been walking through some of, of James. And really, James is writing within a tradition of literature that's known as wisdom literature. The ancient Hebrews and the first century Jews, this type of literature that they had would be focused upon how to live according to the will of God. That's how they would phrase it. Another way of saying this might actually be how to live well. Or as Jesus said it, I think, is, is that he came to give life and life to the full. The fullness of life. And so this wisdom tradition tries to bring us within that idea of living life to the full. James, as tradition tells us, the writer of this particular letter was the brother of Jesus. He was a leader of the church in Jerusalem, which at that time was primarily Jewish followers of Jesus. As the leader of that particular church in Jerusalem, he was necessarily caught up in and deeply involved in one of the early struggles of the church for Gentile inclusion. Gentiles were those that were not part of the Jewish faith. So this passage that James is talking to us about is specifically what wisdom is, and even gives us some examples of what wisdom is not. So in the Jewish thought, wisdom is not attained through a classical education. That's not how you gain wisdom. It's primarily given through a relationship with God. And I think we know this intuitively, because when we say that someone is wise, and I, so I think of my granddad as being wise, but he didn't have any education behind, beyond high school. So wisdom is not tied to sitting in a bunch of classes and learning that way. I think we also know it because typically we don't start calling someone wise until they start getting more gray hairs and they've lived longer because you don't actually become wise until you've lived a full life. Wisdom is more about the life that you live and how you are living it. So thinking of this same idea of living in the way of wisdom and now in the Christian church, we think of discipleship really as that same type of path as a way of life. And if we think about discipleship in the church, do we not often immediately think of, okay, if I'm going to be pursue my discipleship or increase in discipleship, then I'm going to attend a study. That's just what we revert to. The catalogs of all of our bookstores love it. They title it discipleship, and here's a bunch of books. So we get this idea that as long as we read all the books that we can and we go to as many studies as, you, as we can, then somehow we're going to be a disciple. Now, I'm saying that as one with an office full of books and a house full of even more books and one who's leading a study that I'm glad that people are coming to and I would advocate for that, but it's not equal to discipleship. Part of it, but not equal to So James tells us towards the beginning of his letter, he says that religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Oftentimes when you hear this phrase of orphans and widows, it really is encompassing the vulnerable 
people of our society. So James is telling us that religion is not a set of beliefs that we cram into our head and have this intellectual assent to these type of beliefs. He's saying religion is caring for the most vulnerable in our society. Religion and our belief system are the actions that we put into place. So this is wisdom. Wisdom is a way of life. It is a way of life that marks the disciples of Jesus. So I'd mentioned that James, as being the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was caught up in this struggle over Gentile inclusion in the church. So the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. When they began their initial gatherings, there was nothing, there was no reason for them to believe that their path of following Jesus would or should be anything but Jewish. The first Christians were actually seen as just a sect of Judaism at the time. So then came along a Jewish Pharisee by the name of Paul. And it could be argued that Paul never even really gave up his Jewish practice or his Jewish identity. But he started preaching a gospel of Gentile inclusion. And what he was saying is that someone outside of the Jewish faith could follow this Jewish Messiah without actually becoming Jewish themselves. They could be a follower of Jesus without first becoming Jewish. So this question rocked the first century church. They couldn't get along because of this idea. Why? The symbol of Christian unity is the Lord's Supper. So 2,000 years later through history, we've simplified the Lord's Supper down to just bread and a cup of juice. But in the first century, the Lord's Supper was a full-on potluck. That's what the Lord's Supper was. And so in Jewish practice, they would not sit down at a meal with someone who was also not Jewish. And so now this meal that was the symbol of Christian unity became the very place of division because they couldn't sit down and eat together. So they had to try and figure out a way forward for this. How could these people who were outside of the Jewish faith, enter into this faith that now Paul is preaching is open to all. How can they sit down and eat with each other? Because when you eat with each other, you're saying, I am a part of you and you are a part of me. We are one. So this was a deep conflict, and James knew it intimately. And when he writes this letter, he tells us, in the James, that the antithesis of wisdom is a selfish ambition that leads to conflict. Now, I think we need to understand that conflict in and of itself is not bad. Sometimes we need the conflict in order to grow. That's not the bad thing. But it's the selfish ambition that leads to that conflict, and then oftentimes it's conflict itself that becomes the seedbed of that selfish ambition. And that's the piece that James is telling us is the antithesis of wisdom. Wisdom is living in right relationship with God, living in right relationship with others, living in right relationship with the world. And if we are focused on our own interests and in our own ambition, then we can never be in a right relationship with anybody else because we're more focused on how we can present ourselves. We're more focused on what we need to protect. We're more focused on the areas of control that we're losing. We're more focused on how we can make ourselves feel more important. So in our own business world and in our political world, it is driven by selfish ambition. 
to climb the corporate ladder, you got to have at least a little bit of selfish ambition. If you're going to become a CEO somewhere, there might be a lot of selfish ambition that comes into that. I think it's probably pretty safe to say that if you're a political figure in Washington, selfish ambition got you there. Our world itself is driven by selfish ambition. And if we're not careful, then that seeps into our interactions in the church. So then we start expecting the church to be like a business. And we start using business models and business language to drive growth in the church. And our pastors are supposed to be CEOs and business leaders. And this is not the church. We're not a business. We start throwing in ideas of political nature, whether that is our own political party affiliation and expecting the church to line up with a particular political platform, or we start acting in ways like politicians, where we're finagling for our own self-interest in committees or outside of the committees. When this enters the church, this is when conflict arises And in a very real sense, we cease to become the church and just another civic or community organization in town. So when we gather as disciples, we're gathering as something different. We're gathering as those who look out for others. We're gathering as those who put interests, other people's interests above our own interests. We're gathering together as those who are seeking to follow Jesus in everything that we do, in all our aspects of our lives. Living according to wisdom in the way of wisdom is living in community well. So James gives us, towards the beginning of this passage that we read, a list, if you will, of what wisdom is. In, chap- in, in verse se- chapter 3, verse 17 He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. So understand that this list cannot be viewed as just a checklist that we can just go down and check, check, check. Okay, I'm wise because I hit maybe four of them. It's not a checklist to go down. It's not an exhaustive list of what wisdom is, but it's a good starting place for us. As we go through this, I'll offer just a couple of comments for each one of these. First, wisdom is pure. Oftentimes we think of purity as in opposition to sinfulness. We see those as opposites. But if we take that word outside of a religious context, maybe we get a better understanding of it, that Purity, if we talk about something is pure sugar, we're saying it's without mixture. That we're following in this way of of wisdom, we're following in the way of Jesus without mixture, not mixing in other things. So basically what this means is that we can't be looking after ourselves and our own selfish ambitions while also being focused on love of our neighbor. James says that wisdom is peaceable, and peace does not mean the absence of conflict. Peace is the restoration of relationships. So being peaceable does not just mean we go through life as being nice and amiable and not causing a ruffle. It means we are actively seeking ways in which to restore the broken relationships around us. Wisdom is gentle. Again, gentle is not nice, But here's the image that comes to my mind for gentleness. And it's probably not the same image that you get. I think of a crocodile. And they're not exactly the most cuddly of creatures. And they'll probably kill you if they see you. But a mother crocodile, have you ever seen the nature documentaries? Where a mama crocodile has all of her hatchlings. And maybe the hatchlings are in danger. They've got to get across the river. They've got to go someplace else. And what does the mama crocodile do? Open up her jaws and all these little helpless hatchlings climb into her jaws. These jaws are some of the most powerful jaws on the face of the earth. And their teeth are razor sharp and yet these helpless hatchlings are completely unharmed and brought to safety. That is gentleness. It's power. 
its strength, but it's used in control, and it's used to help other people. That is gentleness. Continuing on then, wisdom is being, is willing, sorry, wisdom is willing to yield. This means that if you're in an argument for some, about, over something, means you put your own self-interest to the background, and you be, you give the benefit of the doubt to others, and it means that their relationship is more important than you being right or getting your way, even if your way is better. Even if you are right, the relationship becomes more important. Wisdom is willing to yield. Wisdom is full of mercy. So showing mercy means that you sometimes allow others to be wrong, just like I had mentioned about being willing to yield. But mercy is allowing others to be wrong, again, because the relationship is more important. Being full of mercy means that we live in such a way that we truly believe that we all are the beloved of God. Wisdom is full of good fruits. You don't need to be a gardener or a botanist to understand what James says in chapter 3, that a fig tree cannot bear olives. Wisdom is living in congruence with who we are, bearing the fruit that is produced from our life with God. Wisdom does not show partiality. This was brought up at the beginning of James's letter, and he gave an example of partiality to the church that drives a wedge in our own unity. In that a rich person who has all of the power and the money comes into their gathering, and they say, here, come sit at the place of honor. This is what we used to do with our pews. Rent them out to the highest bidder. Come here, have our place of honor. And then someone who was poor and in smelly and dirty clothes walks in and we push them off to the margins. That is showing partiality. You see, we tend to gravitate towards those who look like us, who think like us, who behave like us, and then our actions start showing that preference for those people who support my own way of life, or who make me feel better about myself. And we show that partiality. But wisdom is not showing that kind of partiality. Wisdom is loving everyone regardless of who they are. And then finally, wisdom shows no hypocrisy. So the Greek word for hypocrisy is actually a theater term. Have you ever gone to the theaters and, and you've seen like the image of the two white masks, one with a smiley face and one with a frowny face. That is hypocrisy. That's the Greek word for hypocrisy. In ancient Greek theater, they would have wore those masks to be the character that they were asking for. So to be a hypocrite is to put on a mask and portray yourself as something other than what God created you to be. We do this. We learn it as we grow up. We don't have too many masks when we're a child. And then through adolescence and in our maturing, we learn more and more ways to put on our masks to cover up who we are because we're trying to avoid pain or because we're trying to present someone that we think they'll like better. But wisdom is taking off those masks. So, it's often said that wisdom comes in few words, and I've already gone beyond the few words. So I'll wrap this up. How do we gain this wisdom? How do we gain this wisdom that is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy? James ends our passage this morning with the phrase that Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He also talks about have friendship with God. Wisdom comes through a developed relationship with God. I know it's a Sunday school answer, but wisdom begins in prayer. That is where we develop our relationship with God. That's where we hear from God. Prayer is not so much us talking to God. Prayer is us listening to God. 
Wisdom, then, is also shown through our life and our works, and thus wisdom needs to be practiced. We're not all of a sudden going to wake up and be full of mercy and without hypocrisy. It doesn't happen just at the snap of a finger. It takes practice. It takes practice to show mercy to to people. So, draw near to God, and he will plant the seeds of the wisdom in your life. And he's going to continue walking by your side as you grow in that way of wisdom. Amen.